All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order at 7.08. Um, first item on the agenda is uh, approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, next Aye. up is What's Good in 109. Thank you, Mr. Begley. Take two. Uh, what's good in 109 for March 2022? I'll go a little faster. We'll post the whole thing online. Uh, this is a look at St. Patrick's Day festivities from around the district. Really cool things across all six buildings. You can check out more pictures on our Facebook page. Not going to give away a ton on it, but Wilmot just crowned their first ever fifth grade robotics champion today. A really cool unit where high school students from the area actually came in to work with our fifth graders in their STEAM classes and teach them a lot of... Uh, lessons and things about robotics and uh, our kids did this all virtually but this is a program that you know by all accounts has been a, very much a success at Wilmot and we hope to expand across the district we will be bringing that to a future board meeting you'll get to meet this team art from around the world students at Shepherd their art is on display here at the district office they had to throw a dart at a map of the world and whatever country it landed on they had to design some sort of art piece that reflected the culture and history of the country so there you see Peru and Greece, the waffle for Belgium, points for creativity for that one, Jamaica, Egypt, Spain, Malawi, so all over the map there with uh, that art assignment. A really cool thing that happened at Walden today is all four of our elementary schools have the buddy system where older classes pair with younger classes and today a fourth grade class went down to the first grade and kindergarten hallway and paired up with their little buddies and helped them learn their vowels. So these kids, these older kids, designed their own games, designed their own ways to kind of teach and reinforce these younger students, caught some really sweet moments and interactions between the older and younger kids that we'll make into a little video that we'll put on social media. And then a little later in the day, the Lighthouse team from Kipling, these are fourth graders as well, went into the younger rooms and led the class for 20 minutes in some St. Patrick's themed day activities, talked to those kids and there was pressure being in front of a room full of kindergartners for 20 minutes. So they'll talk a little bit about that and we'll have more on that in an upcoming newsletter. A big congrats to the uh, musical cast and crews from Caruso and Shepard from last week, two really good productions. And you know they didn't get to do this last year, so it was kind of great to have the stage back open and on. Uh, so good job to everybody that worked both on the stage and behind the scenes. And we've got a quick little 30 second update here on a big project that will impact next year's musical, the Caruso Auditorium. So it's just step one, but exciting to see work being done on the outside of the building. And again, that's going to last through the rest of 2022. That's expected to be. One really cool thing that was brought to my attention is we advocate for our students not only inside the buildings, but out. Uh, this is Nurse Nora Moscos from South Park. I hope I said that right. And uh, she was recently invited to speak at an event for the Illinois chapter of the JDRF, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, uh, on what she does every day in schools to help manage uh, students with diabetic needs. And so she was invited along with another South Park parent to present their uh, really fantastic story of her taking her message out and about and actually meeting another parent that lived in the Deerfield area that had no idea that we provided these services and actually got them interested in maybe attending District 109 in the future. So good job, Nurse Moscos. And then a big shout out to all six of our PTOs. Um, in the two years I've been here, I have seen more and more collaboration and just the spirit of coming together from all six schools. And this is just some snapshots of the truckloads full of supplies that they collected over the last 10 days or so for refugees uh, leaving Ukraine. Um, just whether it was personal care products, food, other sort of non-perishables, the six PTOs really came together and uh, really put forth a, a great effort. A uh, big shout out to Joey Rosen from Kipling who kind of quarterbacked the whole thing. They actually had to work with a second charitable organization because we collected so much stuff, the first charity ran out of room. So really great um, effort by our six PTO. So congrats to them. That leads us to tonight's featured school, the Walden Wildcats you see sitting in front of you here. Just some quick things before we get to our guests. The first graders at Walden just finished their map drawing unit. Uh, I had a fun little video to play that we're not gonna chance today. 
Can you guess the number one thing that the first graders of Deerfield put on a map after their house, after school, after the police station, all these other things? Cool. Starbucks. So statement of the times, that's where these kids know, that's where these kids go. Dunkin' Donuts is also on a bunch of them too. Uh, but really cool uh, to hang out with them and kind of see how their mind worked on all of that. Walden, like Shepard too, has just recently started composting at lunch. Doesn't smell great all the time, but um, this is from the Destination Imagination team. It's part of their challenge this year. And uh, like the older, their older counterparts at Shepard, uh, it's teaching these kids that you know, we can do different things with how we get rid of food waste uh, and how we take care of the environment. So really cool to see that going. Um, this is something third grade classes do all the time, um, has been going on for years, the class economy, robust and strong. This is from a recent auction that they had. So third graders across the district uh, sign up for and actually apply for jobs. Um, so the, on the bottom right you see a third grader filling out a job application for a role that they would like to play in the class. And believe it or not, the number one role, requested role is tech support. Uh, but then they go through the interview process. They make sure that you know, they've put down the right credentials. They actually get paid a salary. And then the money that they collect, they get to use in the auction to collect prizes and other things like that. So kind of a really good real world example of on a very small scale about how the economy works and how it's important to market yourself to make sure that you're showing the skills you have to qualify for a certain job. These guys, some of them were third graders last year. Did you guys do that? Yeah? Was that fun? Ah, okay. As long as you got the prizes out of it, that's good. <laughs> well, let's bring up our featured guest to talk about March Reading Madness. Very appropriate with the basketball tournament going on. We have Sabrina, Owen, and Haley. Come on up. And uh, I'll give you guys the mic, and I'll step in whenever I need to. Owen, you're going to kick it off. All right, so this is the... So we're doing this thing where we hide a book around the school. It's called I Promise by LeBron James, and it's hidden around the school the whole month. And if one person from, from your class finds it, then everyone in their class gets to write their name in it. And if, when you find it, you get to put it back and hide it again. And that's kind of all it is. Um, so every Friday, um, there is like a theme that we dress up for, and um, like some we're like reading under the stars, mismatched clothes, and some others, and um, we get to like dress up, and it's like really fun. And tomorrow you guys are bringing beach towels to school. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So we're doing this. Um, uh, Bernie's Book Bank Drive, and we are, um, the whole school collected books, and philanthropy, and people outside of philanthropy are, um, we finished a few days ago sorting out books for, um, Bernie's Book Bank, and, um, and they wouldn't take books that were, that were ripped, that had, like, writing in it, or um, other than names, or um, stuff that um, involved religions, um, but uh, um, all those other books are going to a different charity, a different charity, and um, there were so many books. Like I helped sorting, there were a lot, and um, and Ms. Schmidt um, like directed the whole thing, cause yeah, and um, it was really fun to sort the books, and uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so this is a book challenge, and we're, our goal is to read a thousand books, and we got there uh, in two weeks. And okay, they were supposed to do it in four weeks. They did it in like a week and a half. Yeah. Right? And because we got a thousand books, um, our principal, Miss Stringer, is buying us new like recess equipment, like jump ropes, hula hoops, basketballs, and stuff like that. Um, so, the Philanthropy Club is um, an organization to help the school. Um, it's open to fourth and fifth graders, and we meet once a month in Ms. Schmidt's room. All right. Anything else you guys want to say? Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I like it. Well, thank you, fourth and fifth graders. That's March Reading Madness. 
And I did not give proper due to Ms. Schmidt, who is here tonight, the organizer of it all. Uh, and Mrs. Berwick, the assistant principal at Walden, her first year here. She's also with us tonight, along with all of these probably pretty proud moms and dads right now. Uh, and that is what's good in 109. We have a little gift for you guys from Ms. Schmidt uh, for your presentation tonight. And then if we could just take a quick picture with the board. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question that is going to bother me. Hey, yes, questions. Did I told you, you there may be questions. Where did you guys find that LeBron James book? Uh, I found it. Where was it? It was like they're like ha hidden, like like under tables and like in between doors. Oh my god! And then where did you hide it? Or they didn't find it yet, so it's a secret. Um. No, they mm -hmm. found it. I think every class found it. Oh, okay. I, I hid the book. Where did you hide it? <laughs> where did you hide? Um. Oh. I hid it. Um. <laughs> behind. So there is this little table with um. Two chairs that people call the Walden Cafe because um, some people eat there. I don't know why, um, but they do. And yeah, like if you get late lunch or something, and um, your teachers won't allow you to eat, but I, or I don't know, um, or some reason you can't eat in your classroom, you eat there. And I hid it behind a stool, and somebody found it five minutes after, or something like that. So yeah. All right, thank you. I feel much better. That sounds very exciting. I have a question for you guys. Is this the first year you've done this program? Yeah, I think it's our, first, our all of our first years because last year it's only open to fourth and fifth graders, and last year we couldn't do it because right. of COVID. So this is all of our first year. We also didn't do it last year because of COVID. Right. Well, this is awesome. I actually have two third graders at Walden, one in Miss Montgomery and one in Mrs. Devitt. I don't know if either of you guys had those teachers last year. Yeah, we had Miss Montgomery. I had Miss Devitt. Fantastic. <laughs> and I have never seen them read so many books in two weeks. They're go, they go upstairs, they run up, they grab their clipboard with the log that you guys gave them. And they have been so excited. So you guys have done some magical things for those students at Walden. So thank you so much. And I hope that this is something you guys would consider doing again next year. Yeah, you, you think gotta, so? Okay. Got to up the ante, though. Yeah, we got to do, what, 5,000 books? <laughs> 5,000, wow, quite a jump. Uh, any other questions? All right, and they're, they're very shy about speaking. I'm sorry about their shyness. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much. Good job. OK. All right. I can actually smile today. Look at that. You gonna go behind you, Mike? Yeah. I'll take one quick and then mom's dad's I'll get out of the way. Thank you guys so right. much. And as, as always, our guests are welcome to stay for the exciting goings on of a school board. Safe travels. Everybody's traveling. Great job. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. Uh, Nick, next up is our superintendent's report. Oh man, I have to follow that. You know, you could rearrange the agenda. Yeah. I, in front of them, so yeah. you're not showing up every time. This is, uh... That's always the left job. Man. The thing that always strikes me every single time with the kids, they're just so well-spoken and composed on camera, enthusiastic, not a note, just fired up and uh, ready to go. So, okay, let me see if I can get this right here. Yeah. Oh, so I'm not able to. Okay, no, sorry. Go ahead and drive, uh, Eric. That's okay. No, oh, okay. There you go. Oh, right, left. Thank you, Jeeves. Let's see if I can get it right this time. I do so much better with a clicker. Uh, <laughs> All right, so 
Uh, I've been out and about in 109 had a, uh, during Institute Day, which was February 22nd, uh, hit all six of our buildings. Got a chance uh, for the first time to see the entire staff. That was a really terrific opportunity for me. And see a picture, share a little bit about uh, who I am and um, what we're working on, the mission and vision. You see a picture of my son up there as well. So talked about uh, uh, what's important to me, but then also the important work that uh, we're doing in the district. And then today, over at Wilmot, we got a great uh, display of really amazing uh, work that uh, the high school kids are doing with uh, our students at, at Wilmot. So Eric mentioned some of that. Uh, kids are very, very engaged, and it's just astonishing uh, how terrific their robot was. So they won, uh, they won their competition the other day, and uh, these high school kids are going off to the world competition. But uh, importantly for us is they've inspired this whole group of our students at uh, Wilmot, uh, and they've uh, utilized their learnings uh, from the high schoolers in their STEAM classes. So it's really terrific. So a number of things changed uh, in the past month. We had a terrific plan that we articulated in our last board meeting, and then uh, things shifted uh, under our feet shortly thereafter with uh, uh, a release, uh, a late night release of uh, a ruling uh, from uh, from the state, and caused us to to pivot pretty significantly. So, uh, we've moved to a mask recommended environment in the past month. Eliminated the daily certification for both students and staff. Uh, we've eliminated shield testing for extracurriculars. We maintain that obviously uh, for all of our students voluntarily, and uh, removed. Uh, restrictions on uh, evening and after school uh, events. Our local conditions, our staff vaccination rate is exceptionally high, one of the highest in the nation and uh, maybe as high as anybody in the county as well. Our student vaccination likewise is extraordinarily high. Uh, this is the documented uh, vaccination rate of our students, which is nearly 90%. We suspect that it's actually higher than that because we regularly call parents uh, in, in the process of contact tracing and discover that they, hadn't, they haven't yet uploaded their vaccination card and so our vaccination verification. And so we believe it's actually higher than that. Well above the county average in Lake County is the highest vaccinated county in the state. Uh, CDC uh, rates our community level of transmission as low. I want to repeat some of our indicators going forward. Our shield testing prevalence will be very important. The number of positive uh, instances that we have in classrooms, whether that be identified from shield or otherwise. So because of the expansion of the number of home tests, we also have uh, a, a much larger number of folks calling us saying, hey, uh, we have a student at home that is positive. And in Lake County is, has been uh, and continues to be uh, great assistance to us whenever we're concerned about uh, possible spread in, uh, in one of our classrooms. All of this is subject to change uh, based upon guidance from the CDC or from the Lake County Health Department. I want to hand off to Joanna Ford, our COVID czar, <laughs> to talk about our conditions in 109. Happy to hand off that title at any point in time. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. I always want to start by just thanking um, our nurses, always, and um, you know all members of, of my team who assist with this, and, and also by thanking our, our families who've just continued to be extremely receptive anytime uh, members from our team are reaching out, our nurses, and also the Lake County Health Department. So big thank you to, to all of our uh, families, everyone in our community. So our shield testing positivity in this past week was 0.69%. Um, we've noted that it has not been above 1% since early January, which we attributed to a return from winter break, most likely. Um, we do want to be transparent and share that we did experience outbreak, clusters of outbreaks in two classrooms over the past uh, about week or week and a half. 
We were in um, close consult with the Lake County Health Department and really appreciated their assistance with this. I want to um, just take a brief minute to, to let everybody know or remind them. I know all of you are well-versed in this also at this point, but we consider outbreak status to be either um, looking at 10% of a core group or three or more cases. And a core group could be defined as a classroom, um, a small subset, so if kids were working outside of a classroom together for an you know, extended period of time, it could be an athletic team, any core group associated with our school setting um, we would look at. So, um, But it also has the additional definition of we're looking in a 14-day window. Um, these obviously were much closer than that extended 14-day period. And we are doing um, contact tracing ourselves first and then also with the Lake County Health Department to say were those cases, um, we weren't attributing them to outside of school to hit that 10% or three or more cases, meaning we did not have reason to believe we got to 10% or three cases um, thinking that those uh, individuals had other close contacts outside of school. Someone in their family was positive, for example, or um, someone on their soccer team or dance team. So we start a higher level of concern reaching outbreak criteria or potential outbreak status um, once we're hitting those thresholds. We then previously and also continue to send notification to families if we think we are approaching that status or if we've reached it and work with the Lake County Health Department for suggestions and recommendations, which um, prior to this situation and, and even moving forward um, has always included implementing what we call outbreak testing, which is just a cadence of additional testing for students or staff who would be associated with these um, outbreaks or potential outbreaks. We've had, um, you know, you don't ever wanna be in this situation, but great success with that outbreak testing which includes uh, one to two additional testing opportunities each week for students or staff who would be associated with that outbreak scenario. Um, so all these bullet points say, families in the classroom are notified, um, additional testing was offered, and you just keep that cadence going until you see no additional positives in those classrooms. All right, um, how you can help in the effort, you know, to our families, to our communities, huge thank you as we faded the um, daily notifications, um, certifications, we have seen people calling or emailing our nurses every morning to report that their child is symptomatic. Thank you for doing that. Please keep doing that. That is our, you know, one of our best um, lines of defense. Do not send your child um, to school if they are not feeling well. Keep them home, report to your school nurse, and they will help give you advice in terms of next steps. Um, properly fitted mask is the you know best defense against the virus if you choose to do so. If you make that you know choice for your family, please continue to send your child to school with a properly fitting mask if that's the choice you made for your individual child and for your family. Vaccination is extremely effective, um, so please make sure you have if you choose to voluntarily disclose your child's vaccination status, we will include that in another round of communication. If you have not had the opportunity to disclose your child's vaccination status, please please encourage you to do so. And um, we are so appreciative of those who are continuing to participate in shield testing every week. Our numbers continue to be strong, um, and that is a great and obviously very effective measure for us. Okay, am I taking this one also? Okay, thank you. So what to expect from us going forward, there'll be a communication sent uh, tomorrow to families with information detailing our current mitigations and also our future uh, communication procedures. You can also expect one on the Sunday prior to the return to school as well uh, to make sure that we're uh, maybe a somewhat expanded uh, communication at that point, but you'll be hearing from us soon and then also prior to our reentry. Uh, we're going to continue testing for symptomatic individuals as well as uh, our close contacts. And shield testing, we can expect that to continue for the, the balance of the year. It's hard to overstate how important that will be for us. I'd like to, uh, again, say thank you to our families who are participating in that. And thank you to our families in, in general. I have been absolutely astonished and so impressed with uh, how flexible our parents have been 
uh, with our nurses uh, as they work with um, uh, trying to uh, uh, keep our kids in school through tests to stay and other things, uh, whether it be the daily certification, letting us know when their kids have a symptom of some sort, uh, just an extraordinary level of flexibility from our parents and helping us be successful and helping us help them as well. I'd like to remind uh, everyone that the primary goal has been and will continue to be to get our kids into school and keep them there. It's likely that we are going to be dealing with COVID on an ongoing basis, uh, uh, probably seasonally uh, shift from uh, a pandemic uh, to endemic, whether we're there yet is uh, somewhat uh, in dispute. As the health department says, the, the uh, pandemic is over politically, but not scientifically. Uh, that means that we may be or will, will dial up or dial back mitigations and it'll look different from period to period. Of course, we're concerned about what post spring break is going to look like uh, after winter break. Uh, we really had a, a touch and go um, situation there with a lot of kids coming back uh, from vacations and, uh, and having COVID. And so we certainly hope to avoid that. Uh, we are going to uh, do what we need to do to limit the spread of infection and maintain continuity of instruction and also really importantly maintain our kids' uh, social experience. So uh, spring break is coming up for our student staff and uh, families and administrators. Uh, unplugging is incredibly important for everyone. I really wanna encourage everyone to take time off. They have absolutely earned it and I hope they come back uh, safe and sound and we look forward to uh, a, a much better re-entry after spring break than we had winter break. And with that, we'd be happy to entertain any questions uh, from the board. So I know uh, we have an informational item later about the resolution regarding COVID-19 operations. Would you want to wait till then to have some questions about the strategy? Would that be more appropriate? Probably should, yeah. Okay, all right, that was it, thank you. Okay. I have a couple of questions for Joanna and one for you. So regarding the two classrooms that had an outbreak in them, how many kids were in those two groups? Yeah, so in talking to the health department, we're not sharing because they're still doing contact tracing exact number for each class, but both of them met um, outbreak criteria, which would mean three or more cases. So there were three or more in each of the two groups. Yep. And were they within roughly the same, were they the same week? Yeah, not same building though. These are two yeah, different buildings. Two different buildings, yep. same week. And how many, how much time had passed between that week and when we went to mask optional? So it was probably two weeks, about mm -hmm. two weeks after. Um, when was the last time we had a similar situation arise? Um, in terms of full outbreak criteria, mm -hmm. I, can, I wanna give you like the exact date, but um, it's been a few months. Okay, probably since maybe when, like the last vacation? Prior, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. And then a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, are you thinking that after spring break, you might, that the district might want to take a stronger position about masks for a week or two after spring break? Or are we going to take a wait and see approach? We're going to take a, we're certainly going to take a wait and see approach. So the, the uh, mitigations in general are going to be dialed in classroom by classroom or grade level by grade level as the case might be. Uh, to date, the issues that we've had uh, are within specific classrooms. And so uh, we've got a resolution later on uh, in the on the agenda uh, relative to our, our mitigation. So we'll consult with the health department and look at the best way to uh, mitigate uh, the spread within a given classroom that may be dialing up masks in a given instance. Uh, it could be uh, it could be any number of different things. Also, uh, uh, resuming uh, greater spacing uh, within a classroom for a period of time. Uh, the, the main thing we want to avoid is sending a classroom of kids home. And, uh, it, uh, and, and we also certainly want to avoid the spread of the virus because what that means, in addition to uh, illness, is that students need to be out of the building for an extended period of time and socially and academically, that's something we really wanna avoid. So we'll dial things up 
uh, in consultation with the health department as we need to. I don't expect, I certainly hope to avoid uh, a, a grade level or a, or a building. Um, and I expect uh, from what we can see so far that it'll be restricted to individual classrooms. Thanks. Hmm? I have a quick question. Okay. The shield, the additional shield testing that we're doing, is that covered by the state, the cost? Yeah. So basically what we do is we're testing any particular classrooms or um, core groups. We just test them on a day where it wouldn't be their building's day. But we have other buildings testing that day. So essentially we just bring those samples over to where we're testing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I just wonder. If like and if we're not, you know, shield testing, we would buy NAC. We're just alternating with what we already have. But yes, it is covered. And then with the new mitigation, the new, when we dialed back some of our mitigations, did that change the shield testing opt-in? Did more, did well, any, was there any noticeable difference? In yeah, we've families? been watching our numbers. I mean, we've seen some variability now that it's not required for extracurriculars, but we, but we still have a really strong number of students testing, which is great. Yeah. Thank you for all you do. Welcome. Terry, it sounded like you had a question. Yeah, I do have a quick question. Um, so. How are you addressing the students who are um, uh, positive in those classrooms? Are they able to zoom in um, to their classrooms? Is there any interaction with the teacher or the class, or is it just them watching? Yeah, so same it's criteria as it's been, you know, throughout the pandemic. It's that live streaming opportunity for the students who are positive in an isolation, but with still the five-day isolation period return on day six, um, as long as uh, students are not actively symptomatic still, as well as, um, you know, looking at anyone who would be considered a close contact would have the option to live stream. Um, so still same criteria, anything specifically COVID related per our contact tracing. Does that thank answer you. your question? Yes, thank okay, you. Sure. And I, final thing relative to that, uh, the question, Sari, one of the things that's impressed me is that the live streaming has gotten better with a recent, uh, thanks RJ, working with the staff, uh, utilizing an iPad uh, on a roller, being able to move uh, a student on an iPad around that is live streaming. Um, kids really ad have adapted remarkably well in many instances to that. and pulling kids into small group activities and, and uh, really taking it into their own hands to make sure that the student uh, is fully participating. So it's, it's certainly progressed from the early days of the pandemic, but it's uh, we still want to avoid. Thank you. All right, if there's no other questions, uh for Mike, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is our first opportunity for community participation relative to matters on the agenda. We welcome your comments and questions tonight. The first period of community participation is for items related to tonight's agenda, and the second period of community participation near the end of the meeting is open for all matters. If you wish to comment, please fill out a community participation form located at the counter in the kitchenette area or at the front reception desk. You can give those to Rebecca Rudd sitting here to my left at the end of the table. We will call you up one at a time to the podium to speak. Please limit the length of all comments to no more than two minutes. Becky, do you have any? No. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll move on next to our information items. Uh, John, first up is uh, freedom of information requests. Yeah, there are three in your packet. Uh, there were two that were seeking information regarding insurance and bonding information. And then there was another seeking uh, emails and text messages regarding COVID mitigations. Okay. Any questions for John on the FOIAs? All right, thank you, John. Um, next up, item 6.2, uh, new mission and vision. And uh, you, there was a memo in our board packets related to that. So uh, Mike and Eric. It's all yours. Yeah, so included in the packet is, and this is prompted by uh, Eric, I think we have the, uh, the mission and vision uh, available for display. Uh, we have uh, uh, two new options. Can we get to the before and after as well there? So we can see both options. So based on our last meeting, uh, we went, uh, sent it back to uh, Eklund Consulting and said, hey, uh, would you like to 
take another look at this and see if uh, there's an alternative that you might be able to propose. And so in your board materials, what you have is the original and then an option for the mission and then the original and then an option for the vision as well. And uh, it's on the agenda uh, here as an information item to be discussed and uh, hopefully we align on that. And then uh, in the, uh, uh, later on in the uh, board meeting, we'll have that, uh, the mission and vision adoption as an action item as well. So uh, for board discussion, uh, we had uh, the original uh, with, a, uh, with a new consideration uh, for the mission and then the same thing for the vision and wanted to get uh, have an opportunity for board discussion and uh, reach alignment on it for later approval. What was the impetus for circling back to them to get, because you, you initially had presented the mission and vision. Was there feedback yep. that was? Two, two things. Um, a warm, fuzzy feeling from Mr. Morrison that uh, prompted us there, I think, uh, was the description. Uh, but then also, Maureen, you mentioned that hey, I'm looking for something potentially a little punchier. And so uh, short of bringing the, the, the entire band back together, we said uh, we've got uh, Eklund Consulting for a reason. And then uh, he worked with uh, somebody that uh, is a professional uh, writer, um, a marketing writer, and the two of them uh, re-examined. And then from there, uh, Sarah and I looked at, there were a couple different options, and um, uh, we picked the one that we thought was going to be uh, most attractive to the board and put that up for the new consideration. Just, just to qualify that, I mean, we, I don't think that either of us were advocating for one over the other. We just wanted to give another option in case it helped people or, or uh, you know, people felt like it met the need better. Right. So in the first mission, you have your three bolded words. Are those the same three words you would continue to bold in the new mission, or you wouldn't bold things at all? I'll, I'll look to Eric on that one, whether uh, in the communication of this, you would want to have those bolded. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think um, that is something we would continue to to look at doing. Uh, depends on how it's presented. Um, also, on that memo was a a tagline that was suggested of create, collaborate, challenge. So mm -hmm. those are kind of the key words there. Should I open the party with some feedback? <laughs> is it okay. warm? Is it warm and fuzzy? <laughs> no, I, I was just saying. I, I thought the other. Well, it doesn't matter okay. what I thought about the other stuff. So with respect to the mission. As between those two, I prefer the original because I feel that the proposed revision sort of stands things on their heads a little bit. So just to give you an example of what I mean by that, where this says the district it ignites curiosity, uh, will foster self-confidence through challenging experiences. There are a lot of ways to foster self-confidence. So this sort of says, this is how we're going to do self-confidence. And I think it's too narrow. I think it puts the wrong focus. Whereas the original says, we're going to have challenging experiences in order to generate self-confidence. But it's not saying that's the only way we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So I prefer the original. And I think that's my comment goes through the whole thing. That's uh, very good. Sorry. With, with respect to the vision, with some adjustment, um, I would, pr I like the second one, but can I suggest how I would tweak the second one? Please do. I would change it, the order of things and the modifier of things so that it would read, we will develop each student to be academically prepared, socially skilled, and emotionally resilient by forging connections, et cetera. Those are my, and then with respect to the last thing, the new content, I actually like it, but I think it's in backwards order. I think it ought to be challenge, collaborate, create. I think that's more the logical sequence of how mm. things would go mm. as opposed to the order they're in. Those would be my feedback. Mm. Um, I love, Andy, your feedback was amazing. 
for me, the the ending of the new consideration for vision just reads, I, I can't get over it. It sounds so mouthy. By forging connections and cultivating unique talents within our classrooms and community. That's just, it reads funny to me. It doesn't, and you, I get caught up in reading it to even, for it to even mean anything. It's, it's too much to digest and it shouldn't be that hard to make sense of your vision sentence, I think. Maureen and Andy, did you have any negative or concerning feedback on the original vision? Because Andy, it does sort of list out those three things closer to what you just described, or am I wrong? Where it says resilient emotionally, skilled socially, and prepared academically. Do you see how it lists them out in that way you just described? Actually, I have it. Actually, I have it flipped. I have, so for example, academically prepared, not prepared academically. So oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Okay. But. I I like the way that Andy flipped those um, those uh, that trio of characterizations. My only concern is that I really think that the feedback that we got um, in before we you know in formulating this was that the emphasis and the importance really was more on the um, social emotional skills rather than academic. So I would flip the words like emotionally resilient, socially skilled and academically prepared, but I would keep them in the same order. I wouldn't put academically first. I just feel like that was not where the emphasis was in the feedback that we got. Yeah. I, I'm aligned with that, Siri. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I really like, uh, I, I, uh, agree with Andy that the first mission, the original mission, I like that better also. Uh, I don't get a vote, but if it's <laughs> worth anything, I uh, really like the way that you phrased the vision, Andy, uh, with Sari's feedback, which sounds like aligns with, uh, uh, with which you're also aligned. And uh, the new content is not up for approval, but I think you're spot on with that as well. And uh, Maureen, if, I wanted to have that new content there because one of the things that you were looking for was something uh, pithy and memorable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I wanted to make sure and add that in there. Um, on our action items tonight, we're approving this. Correct. So what is the recommendation if we were to want to make some of the adjustments, let's say that Andy just described, how would we vote on that? Uh, the way to vote on it would be uh, to vote on the, the mission, uh, the original mission, if you want to take Andy's uh, suggestion, the original uh, mission, and then uh, Andy, if you would then at that time reread what it is that you want to approve and then we'll capture that, we'll grab it from the tape. And then that would be uh, that would be the motion and the vote. So I think, I, I think there's. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, no, go ahead, go Sari. Ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say I think there's still a question between Andy wanting to flip the beginning of the vision with the end of the vision, and Maureen didn't. So I, mean, right, I think we have to resolve my, that before we get to the vote. That was my question: is trying to help Maureen sew up the end of it a little bit. Um, I guess I'm not stumbling as much as maybe you are. So is there a specific word or is it just the uh, order of the words? By forging connections and cultivating unique talents within our classrooms and community. Like, that just seems could, could you turn your mic on? I can't hear you. Sorry. So when we're reading the sentence, we will develop each student to be resilient emotionally, skilled socially, and prepared academically by forging connections and cultivating unique talents within our classrooms and community. That just sounds like a lot. Do you prefer the way it is phrased in the original vision? Where the where the connection part is yeah, I like first that one. instead of second? I, I like the first one better. It's not as it's it doesn't my brain shouldn't have to work so hard to understand a, a vision <laughs> sentence. To me. But I'm only one person, so. I'm just not sure I'm seeing 
a changing of the words other than the location of the words in the vision? Because it still says in the original one, forging connections with, across, and beyond, and cultivating unique talents. We will. Do, so it's the same words. Right, but it's not. A, it's not all at once. It's not all at once. Okay. And it's for yeah. me. It just it, it takes my brain a lot to. What What are we talking about? I actually prefer the the order in the first vision statement, but then would flip the um, you know the emotionally resilient, socially skilled, and academically prepared, like Andy suggested. I if agree. it were up to me, I agree with that. I would be fine with that. And for what it's worth, I was thinking too. I just wanted to point out, like the original language with, that says "within," "across," and "beyond" our classrooms actually was an example that was pointed out this evening as something that was really valued. You saw the fourth graders working with the first grade. That's actually a cross-classroom collaboration that was demonstrated this evening. You can still incorporate that, right? Meaning that it's just fitting that same language, that same language in un, behind in that where it says by forging connections and cultivating unique talents that's where you would put within, across, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Right, but if Maureen's already struggling with the length of the end of that one anyways, are we going to add three words? I mean, it. it well, I, the only difference between it, really, between the first one and the second one, the at the end of the day, is really the order and just starting at is a more action-oriented vision than starting it with by. And I always, I mean, me personally, the starting the vision with a by, with that word was more, pa was passive. Right, the we will I think has a little bit more of a forceful commitment type feel to me, right? And that's literally the only difference is the is changing the the language slightly to become more action oriented, which is why I do like the second one. I'm okay with again reorienting the order, or and if we wanted to include that language, I get your point. What happens if you said we will forge connections? Oh, sorry. We will forge connections within the cross and beyond a classroom and cultivate unique well, talents, I, I think develop that, each student to be resilient or whatever how his words are. Yeah, and I, the we will develop is is the core of it. Right? Forget about like the rest of the language. Right? The saying by forging connections, it's like okay. But can well, you say we will like, forge connections? No, I'm saying well, we will develop. Can I can I take another run at this? Because actually after you pointed out, Maureen, I agree. The tail language on the revision is a little awkward because it talks about forging connections and cultivating unique talents within our classrooms and community. Are we going to be like, we're not really cultivating unique talents in our community, right? It's a little, right? Um, so I could, here's another run at it. What if we say we will develop each student to be, and again, uh, Siri, I'm not sure, do you want, Academically, second or third. Let's put a third. Okay. Yeah. So, what if it said we will develop each student to be academically prepared, socially skilled, and emotionally resilient by forging connections within, across, and beyond our classrooms, and cultivating the unique talents of our students. Of each student. Of each student. Or each student's unique talent. Um, I, you didn't. You didn't change the or, order. You got in the. Oh, I, said, I, meant, I intended to. My okay. brain and mouth didn't cooperate. <laughs> okay. I intended to put academically third. Okay. <laughs> my, my eyes said ignore the arrow or something. Give us one more crack at that, Andy. Yeah, read the whole thing again. Yeah. We will develop each student to be socially skilled, emotionally resilient, and academically prepared by forging connections within, across, and beyond our classrooms and cultivating the, uh, unique, the unique talents of each student. Maureen, does that feel a little better? I had to see it. Oh, okay. I like, I like that. All right, Eric will pop it up. The only question is that time you had socially skilled first and emotionally resilient second, so I don't know. Dude, <laughs> okay. Uh, I've, Andy, you're fired. However you guys want to order yeah. those. <laughs> so, so, Sari, it's emotional, then social, then academic? That would be my order, but Danielle, whatever. Emotionally first? Yeah, then social, then academic.
can we say it's cleaner to say in cultivating each student's unique talents? There you go. Yeah, I like that. Cultivating each student's unique talents. What does that mean? That means that every kid is every kid brings gifts, uh, irrespective of who they are, how old they are, and we want to celebrate what every kid brings to the table. I and actually define really find that. I like the I like the wording of cultivating each student's unique talents. Obviously we are committed to the academic excellence of our students. That's our mission as a school district. But above and beyond that, our students have so much more emotional IQ and so much is more it, talent just beyond the academics. Is it more than just talents though? Meaning that cultivating the uniqueness of each student because yeah because it's like talents it's right. who they are right as a student as a person it's it's a more it's a more um inclusive or it's a, a broader umbrella of uniqueness does that make sense which one is uh, abilities or talents no it would be uh cultivating um the uniqueness of a, of each student each student's uniqueness each student's uniqueness or that yeah there you go and would yeah. you change the first, Annie, I don't know if this is right. We'll do, to me, it means better. We'll develop each student to be emotionally resilient, skilled socially, yeah. and prepared academically. No, he, he flipped it. Socially I, skilled. Now it, sounds, now it sounds funny to me. But maybe socially skilled. Yeah, I think it's because he read it. <laughs> no, just, I don't know. I, it's not, did somebody put up the new version? Because I'm not seeing the new version. I don't think. It's up, but the IT okay. maybe I can't have to help you. All right. <laughs> Please hold, Sari. I'm not keen on uniqueness. What about unique gifts? Yeah, and I don't know. I'm just going to present this, but you, you'll you hear a lot of conversations around that you don't cultivate someone's uniqueness. It's more that you appreciate students for what they bring yeah. to a community. Because if you cultivate someone's uniqueness, like what are you it's almost True. like you're changing yeah. who they are, right? And it's more of like you yeah. appreciate each individual child for the fact that they're unique and they're different and they bring yeah. something to our learning community. So I guess you, I would anticipate you might get questions about like, what does that mean, the word cultivate? Yeah, that's, I think that's a good point on that word. And, but I do think that you having a broader definition of uniqueness is important because it captures, I think, a broader view of all that feedback of that session that we yeah, had. Yeah, I, right? I don't yeah. think you're wrong with uniqueness. I think cultivating yeah. with that might be your issue. Cultivating That's such a good word, though. <laughs> unique gifts. <laughs> I, don't, I think if you start to specify the uniqueness or what you're cultivating, I think it's, it starts to get away from, again, the broadness of that change, right? So the question is the word cultivating. I think, I think what you... But the issue here is, is like, do you, great people are unique. Are we just not a, doing enough to appreciate? I think the what idea we're, what we have. We have yeah. a lot of you know different. You can't get rid of the, the idea right. that I had in my head specifically around it was that so it's more about you know it's not just about their talents right, which yeah. can be cultivated right, but it's also about who they are. Yeah, and not either being both accepting or. A you know providing an you get where I'm going with it like it's it's more of a. Um, so Daniel type in the word empowers. What about embracing? Empowers, yeah. embrace, it's celebrate. Embrace, yeah. Is it embracing. celebrating? It, or, it's, no? Some of it's like do we teach each student individually as as a as a unique individual, right? Some of it is do we you know to your point celebrate or appreciate the unique at talents or gifts or the uniqueness of who they are. Embrace? Embracing. You don't like embracing? I like celebrating. Like I like celebrating better than embracing. I kind of like embracing, too. And do oh, you, you do? Do the word, oh, do the word, put the word buy in, by celebrating each student's uniqueness? No, I don't, no, no. Because no, that means the whole vision yeah. is by celebrating. It's like a separate thought. Sorry, Can I retract celebrating? Because I, I, someone said embracing. Celebrating yeah, sort of feels a little like you're standing back and applauding. Yeah. Embracing feels a little bit more engaging around it. So that's right. Yeah. Is there, should there be a comma after classroom? Is that an Oxford comma? No, I think so. <laughs> yeah, getting... Actually, no, it's not. It's not an Oxford comma, I don't think. The clause. Um, I don't think it's too bad. Yeah, it just, maybe it's a little bit of a run on, right?
forging connections within across. How about this? Pre prepared so. by forging connections within across and beyond our classrooms. Yeah. Um, Danielle, Danielle was going to move embracing each student's uniqueness to the beginning. So we will embrace each student's uniqueness and develop. Or no, how do you get rid of student again? Uh, no, I don't like that. No. No. <laughs> no, I think that if you say, if you, in, if you say, if you say, and beyond our classrooms and by embracing each student's uniqueness, that might be helpful. If you insert by before embracing. I, don't, I think you can just get rid of the and, right? Across and beyond our classrooms, and, br and then it's not a, it would be a semicolon and no, no or a, no, I'm, can't have a semicolon without a colon. Embracing each student's unique. Uh, um, I think that's what where about, we're getting could you, tripped up was this final and because. Could you say while embracing each student's uniqueness? Yeah, it's that, that final and yeah. creates a run on. It'd, right? it'd be either bu try by or while. Dash. That's what it is. Andy, can you turn on your mic? Hi, Siri. Hi, um, thank you. No, no. By, I was going to say by, by forging connections within and across and, and by embracing. embracing each student's uniqueness. There you go. I like right. that. Yeah. That's what I said. And that was what Maureen was saying before. <laughs> She shut it down. Well, no, 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 because you got rid of the and, and I didn't want to get rid of the and. Can I say again how patient our public is, you know, know. as we wordsmith this together? So it's, it's Well, it's, we're voting on it. If so. you had it's great. If you it's actually, it. yeah, it's If good. you had Oxford comma on your school board bingo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have we landed? Thank you. It sounds great. Yeah. I like it. I like it better. Quick, nobody say anything. And what mission did we? Are we sticking with what mission? Well, we have to vote between the two. Uh, no, I think we were sticking to the original. I thought we were sticking with the original. New, new I think so. No, I think we were no. just sticking with the original. The original just okay. the whole first original. Okay. So we're so when we do the vote. We'll vote separately on the original mission, and then new. if Andy wants to make a motion and articulate the new vision in the motion, that would be good. Can you pop that screen up? At Pressure's that time? on. Eric, thank you. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's up there. Yeah, yeah. All you got to do is read. <laughs> Woo, that was fun. The board. Can, can I just throw right. in Andy ha or Mr. Morrison, I'm sorry, had said to reorder the tagline challenge collaborate create i believe that was the note but that's made. not part of the what's oh. being approved tonight that's just a tagline right. Right. okay right. but would we want our mission to align with that if that was in those orders you know what i mean oh yeah that i had rewritten it based oh. on that to just say it where challenging experiences foster confidence collaborative relationships build community and creative environments ignite curiosity there you go that's the reordering of it so that yep. the tagline would match so it's challenge okay. create collaborate or challenge collaborate create where challenging experiences foster confidence collaborative, collaborative relationships build community and creative environments ignite curiosity is that order good yep. that's yep. good yep so someone will have to read that into the motion too. Andy, yeah. congratulations on reading two new things. It's <laughs> <laughs> like a look affair. Teamwork makes a dream work, right? Mm -hmm. oh All right. God. All right. With that, we're going to move on to item 6.3, uh, intergovernmental, intergovernmental agreement to facilitate the sharing of identifiable school student record information between Township High School District 113 and its feeder districts. Uh, Mike, I think that's you. It is. Uh, this is merely an update. So there was a recent change in the state law, and uh, Carrie Piper, who's been doing the, the legal work for the 440 group, uh, recommended that each of the boards approve um, a, a revisited uh, agreement. And so the 112, 
Uh, Bannockburn and 113 have approved. I believe we're the last. Just as a, a quick reminder, the data that is going to be that's going to be shared is going to be aggregated, though, right? It uh, it is uh, it is aggregated, and then each district can then work. So if we want to see where our students have gone, where they have progressed to, okay. Um, so the, the benefit for 109 is for the first time, 109 will be able to see where its students uh, progressed, how they progressed through the high school. So, but the, the, it'll be aggregated for the district. There, we won't be able to track an individual student. Uh, if if the uh, if the districts wish to see uh, how the progression goes, then yeah. uh, then you can see how, uh, how an individual. But one thirteen can't see a one hundred nine student because uh, the agreement here mm -hmm. is, I guess, is the facilitation of data sharing. That's fine. All right. right. The discussion in the four forty. Yeah. Yep. Was that it was I, we they were trying to avoid per, like just by having to be able to identify a specific student mm -hmm. right through that aggregation, so we're going to be able to track cohorts right. through it, but not individual. But if we wanted to, our district could look at a district student through it. Uh, we, uh, if I understand it correctly, if we wanted to uh, see where an individual student wanted, had progressed through one thirteen, we could access that okay. information through this. I mean, it doesn't change my support for this. I'm just, it's right. just more of a, I think it's a little bit of a, it's a slight difference from what I think we discussed in that meeting, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, let me, I'll get back to you and clarify okay. that. Okay. Can I ask a question? If the child has moved on out of our, why would we go look for an individual student's progression? Like what would, what would make So there are times, uh, there are times when uh, we would want to know uh, for an individual student. So if we're looking at uh, how a, whether it be a group or an individual student, um, what progression did the student follow? So that the, the learning that you can get from that is uh, to see uh, for a particular student, look, the student was at uh, um, a, a given place in their learning and where would we anticipate that student reasonably progressing? And then to see, you know, did they uh, did they grow each year that they were there or not? And it helps you dial into okay, so where did uh, where do we meet the student's need or where not? Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of with Maureen though on this one. Is like that's why I was thinking it was going to be aggregated cohort data because that is a sample size that will actually allow us to make decisions or make allow you guys mm -hmm. to diagnose certain things. An individual student, it would be. It would have to be a very unique situation, either a very unique situation with that student directly, or it would be an right. outlier, right? Right. Um, so that's the only two situations that I could think. Is yeah, we haven't discussed uh, to date. The 440 group hasn't discussed anything other than aggregated data. Yeah, because I think there was the concern in that. I think in that meeting with individually identified student data, was that the other districts would then have access to individual student. I mean, it was like, it's our information and then, and then we would have to do something like this, which is probably right. why this is coming up right. is because that got added yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. So we, just so you know, we, this also covers for other reasons too. Like, so right now for our eighth graders at the start of the year, we have every parent um, prior to an official transfer of records. We have every parent currently sign a, um, release early because we want to be able to start our articulation meetings for student services, for example, mm -hmm. so we can meet with those teams and um, other students, you know, for other reasons. So otherwise we wouldn't be able to start openly sharing, this is an example of individual student records, right? Yeah. Um, until we officially transfer records at the Got end of the it. eighth grade year. Okay. This will help us just do that on an easier um, process. And it does have a, in here, um, you know, there is like a scope of records as defined and we do have to have parents you know, we think it's, we're going to clarify this with legal counsel too, like at one point in time, like basically say, yes, I intend to send my child to District 113, right? Yep. You know, so there there are safeguards in here. We have to define the scope of records for parents and guardians. We have to say that, you know, um, obviously you're within our boundaries and you intend to have your child, you know, 
to the best of your knowledge, go to District 113. Um, you know, there is safeguards per yeah. student records law for parents and guardians. So that's a different that's a different use case, right? Yeah. And so I get that, and um, I think that would I think a lot of parents would be surprised that that's not already happening. By the way, <laughs> or it, I mean, well, it is it right is, now. They're but, signing I mean, a specific release. Yeah, exactly. But this helps that, but there are cases too earlier. for your yeah. other question, an example of like where we would to either a much smaller cohort or even individual students, right? Want to know for to look back and see how our, you know, uh, placements were working or how we were providing services. Okay, how did those students perform once they went to Deerfield High School? Because we would want to know, based on how we were providing services and how they were doing with us, like how did that look once they were, you know, articulated and continuing in Deerfield High School? And we'd have to go at a more individual level to do that. That answers my question, so you don't have... I'd like to make a comment also about it. So I'm in favor of this arrangement as well, but... You know, I've said this a few times in the past. I don't think it makes sense that we have so many school districts here, <laughs> right? And I know I've been told multiple times that I'm on a Quixote-esque journey tilting at windmills because it's going to be impossible to change anything. But in some future state, I think it would make sense to have a K-12 education system that you have curriculum that's aligned and the data is aligned in every grade is working to make ensure the success of progression all the way through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. It doesn't make sense to me. And because we don't have it, that's why we need disagreement. Because I do think, anyway, but so I think there is a structural issue that results in our needing this agreement. And I recognize mm -hmm. that structural challenge seems almost insurmountable. Um, but I think this allows us and 113 to ask more to act more like an integrated K-12 district, which I think is good for our kids. Yep, hard to argue with that. All right, um, on to our next item: um, summer work summary and flooring bid results, John. Yeah, uh, each summer the district uh, plans roughly $1.5 million worth of operating uh, dollars for maintenance <coughs> projects. Um, if that number sounds low to you, uh, based on typical summer packages, it's because on top of what we're spending out of operating funds, we typically dip into our capital projects fund to do some uh, work in our, in our buildings. Um, this year, because we have our big ticket item, which is the Caruso Auditorium, uh, already underway in this fiscal year and next. Uh, we don't want to exceed our $1.5 million worth of maintenance projects from operating funds. Uh, so uh, in early January, the FDC met to review uh, the list that's in your packet. Um, the one update on this list is that uh, we had hoped to replace some HVAC equipment this summer. There's no way that we're going to get that equipment in time to do work this year. So we'll put that package to bid in the fall for the summer of 23. Um, but what that does mean is that we had planned to do half of our remaining life safety work. Remember that is on a schedule that we are mandated to complete by 23. Um, we will do the full package of life safety work this summer so that we can uh, shift our focus back to HVAC next summer. Is, will the HVAC survive that long? I mean, I know uh, the, yeah. the the problematic units yeah. uh, were not slated for replacement this summer. So those okay. are on a 15 year. Uh, we're hoping to replace them in a 15 year window. Yeah. Um, there, uh, our, our intention is that this fall uh, we'll bid a package where we will replace one of the VRF units. Those are all the units that were retrofitted for air conditioning back in 2011, 2012. Um, and we want to run that for two seasons to make sure that we have a product that is going to prove to be a lot more reliable than what we've been struggling with currently. Okay. Uh, in the interim, we've stockpiled you know, the parts that we know are known to fail so that we're not going to have to wait for any uh, replacement parts if a unit goes down. Yeah, because yeah, I was just thinking to myself that like if, instead of waiting all the way till next summer if it potentially is a critical need because we can't there's no way you could replace uh one of those units until school is out for the summer okay it's right. needed for heating and cooling so we got can't it. have occupancy while we replace it okay got it okay um so the the uh, uh info item before you tonight uh, that we will ask for approval in april is the flooring package um, this is to replace uh, the gym flooring uh, at Walden, Kipling, and South Park. 
Uh, and then also to replace the corridor flooring and the uh, multi-purpose room tile, uh, uh, the corridor flooring at Wilmot and the multi-purpose room tile at South Park. Uh, that came in on budget at roughly 250,000. Um, so we will ask for the board to approve that in April. Do you have any uh, supply chain concerns about waiting till the April vote? Or do you feel like that's still going to give uh, you a nice window? Yeah, I do, uh, yeah. but they accepted my letter of intent okay. um, to put the order through. So I've already shared with them uh, the cadence that we would expect approval, and they took my letter uh, as, as putting us in the production queue. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for John on this? Hey. I have a question, but I'll wait till after we talk about the landscaping piece. Okay. Because they're kind of connected. John, let's talk about the landscaping piece. <laughs> Item 6.5. Yeah, in early February, we put our landscaping maintenance needs to bid. Um, we had three uh, firms who responded. And the low responsible bidder is more landscapes. Um, we've worked with them in the past. Uh, and we would recommend that the board approve a three-year contract with more landscapes in April. What's up with the uh, the other one? That are they trying to put in like pools and, <laughs> you know, and fountains and sometimes uh, uh, firms yeah. who uh, may not uh, they don't want work the in this realm. Well, no, it. I believe they do. I don't uh, think that they uh, are accustomed to bidding on a project like ours. Okay, All right. put it that way. Can you help me understand with the landscaping what the park district is responsible for versus what we're responsible for? The park district mows. Okay. That, that was my question because I feel like we could get some more mowing. Um, but we're not responsible for that. We do planting. We do trees, we bushes. Do, correct. Yeah. All, all of the areas around our facilities, landscape, uh, pruning, mulching, okay. um, replacing plantings, pruning trees, et cetera. That's us. Okay. So I have a couple of questions relating to the, these bidding process. So in the last couple of meetings, I have asked, hey, is it possible to try to ensure we're spending more money with underrepresented vendors? And you all did some work and said, yeah, it turns out you can't do that. Right. Um, and so I'm just wondering, one, are there, when we're putting out bids, is there something we could or should do that you think might be helpful to at least make a more diverse group of people aware of the bid and to encourage a more diverse group of people to compete for the, the business? Or do you mm -hmm. feel like it's all in this, everyone's looking at the same public source and they all know already? Uh, I mean, we post it uh, in the newspaper as we're required to legally. Um, I know in this instance, we contacted, I think, uh, 15 firms directly that we know have a reputation for working in the area. Um, frankly, we're disappointed that only three came to bid, but I think it has to do with the number of accounts they have and uh, labor shortage. Um, I guess all, my comment is I would invite you as a team to consider, are there things we could do to encourage more engagement with kind of more than just the usual suspects? All right, so that may be rhetorical. Uh, the second question I have is, are there is it uh, uh, permissible to have an environmental responsibility component to the bidding? So are there some vendors who are more environmentally conscious or friendly with respect to the chemicals they use or the waste, the amount of waste they generate or any of those components? Can we have an environmental component to the RFP or process? I don't expect you to know the answer, but I, I, I'd sort of be interested in that at some point. Good. Okay, and then my last question was about the landscaping. And again, just by way of stimulating thought, I don't expect any kind of response here, but it's, I have the impression that mostly our landscaping work is sort of a beautification and decoration point of view. And I wonder, and maybe I'm wrong, but I wonder is there some way to sort of integrate the money that we spend and how we spend it in the outdoors in a way that integrates the outdoors with our educational mission, whether it's planting prairie grasses and gardens or milkweed for endangered monarchs. Um, 
kind of, kind of a more of an environmental. Hey, a horticulturist or culturist here? I, mean, I can't hear you. <laughs> you? <laughs> so I just wonder if there's a way to have our, treat our landscaping from more than just a decorative perspective. Mm -hmm. And that, I know you have to respond to that, but I just want to put it uh, To the earlier question on the RFP and environmentally friendly uh, uh, aspects of our, of our request, we can write, I'm sure that we can write in there you know, what chemicals you use and some will be, we can stipulate any number of different things. It'd be a matter of dialing that in, how we wanted to do that. Uh, whether we could use use our uh, use our basically our facilities in the form of our land landscaping as an instructional tool, whether that be for gardening or other things, there are any number of different things that certainly we can do there, and that can be a that can be a community project, it can be a school project, it can be a joint parks and rec, it can be any, any number of different things. So that's something that uh, I think that um, I've seen uh, and. Probably, Andy, you've, you've seen it as well, where uh, you you can develop um, programming and instruction, and then outcomes, farmers markets, and all sorts of things from things like that. But you have to you have to head there intentionally. So um, I may, we wait and see what we do with the strategic planning and uh, look for opportunities there. Thanks. Yeah, and I was just going to comment, um, and Danielle, you, you might know the answer, or, or Kelly, too, at Walden, historically the PTO at the bus circle had always done the wild prairie. I don't know if that's been maintained over the last couple of years. If they do. We still have a green team, yeah, and okay. they'll come out at least once a year, and they'll have the kids do some fresh plantings. But it's traditionally to Andy to kind of follow up tends to be more grassroots sponsored by the PTOs or really dedicated right. parents versus coming kind of top down from the district. Um, but in doing that strategic plan, one of the potential outcomes could be a focus on outdoor classrooms. And if that's the case, then that all kind of ties in with what you just brought up. All right, uh, we'll move on to the next uh, 6.6, .6, uh, consultant agreement for interim associate principal, Dale. This is for um, Shepherd Middle School has one of their administrators out on an approved leave of absence, and this is the necessary coverage for the administration to effectively um, leave the school. So a consultant agreement for Susan Baker, uh, former employee of the district, coming back to us and finishing out the uh, rest of the school year with us. So the thought process from a recruiting standpoint that we're going to wait through that year, this year with an interim and then recruit. it's just a leave of absence through the end of the show. Oh, it's just a leave. I'm sorry. You're right. No, I'm sorry. Any questions for Dale on that? All right. Thank you. Uh, 6.7 technology update. RJ, I think this is you. Where's the hologram? <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to present uh, this evening. Um, the focus of this presentation is going to be around six primary topics for the upcoming 2022-2023 school year. Uh, there will be time at the end for questions. Um, the first uh, topic is expanding our technology department from four positions up to five. Uh, currently, our four technicians are contracted through our Net56 managed service provider. They support seven buildings and roughly 3,200 end-user devices. Now, this looks like roughly 800 devices per technician. Uh, the typical target ratio is between 450 and 600, so we're a little bit high. Um, these numbers also do not include classroom technology or common area technology. Adding a fifth technician will drop our ratio to one technician for every 634 devices and provide additional service opportunities for both Tier 2 and Tier 3 support needs. I believe this new role will add a roughly $50,000 per year cost to the district, and I expect to absorb this cost in other parts of the overall technology budget. Uh, the next topic is changing our primary internet service provider and expanding our internet bandwidth. Our current primary internet service provider is Net56, and our current internet bandwidth is a shared six gigabit connection across all of our schools. I believe it is in the district's best interest to move to Illinois Century Networks as our provider and a 10 gig shared connection. This will help support our current and future learning needs, and moving to ICN will equate to a roughly 33% reduction in costs, even with expanding our bandwidth up to 10 gigs. The next topic 
is moving the district away from using the public utility company's wide area network, or WAN as I refer to it, um, to a private fiber WAN network. We currently use Net56 as our WAN provider, and they use the AT&T public WAN infrastructure to provide service. This is the same public WAN infrastructure that the general population uses. Although I wouldn't say there's a glaring issue with using the same WAN as everybody else from a web traffic and security perspective, being able to leverage our own private WAN removes potential hurdles both now and in the future. Ultimately, we will have roughly 5.63 miles of new fiber installed in a ring shape around the village of Deerfield. Each school will then connect into that ring with services going in both directions to avoid any possible disruptions. The district will use the E-rate special construction, special construction and Illinois E-rate matching grant to cover 100% of the initial cost of the build. Once the initial build is complete, the district will realize a reduction of over 80% of our current monthly costs. I'm going to ask for board approval for this in the upcoming April meeting. The next topic is specific to the security around our data center. Our data center is the hub for our most important information, and it is located at one of our schools. Although I don't want to highlight the specific security vulnerabilities we have in a public forum, I will say that my focus is on the best practice security measures like limiting physical access, limiting our susceptibility to natural disaster like floods, fire suppression, cooling and humidity, and real-time security monitoring. Based on the needs of our current space, I believe our best option to secure our data center is to relocate it to an off-site location. This location would be a designated data center that contains all of the security considerations I've outlined above. The overall cost for this effort is still being determined, but any costs are expected to be absorbed by the current technology budget. Do you want us to hold till the end? Please, yes, okay. please. The next topic is refreshing our teaching devices at the middle school. Across both Caruso and Shepherd Middle Schools, our teaching devices are currently in their fourth year of use. This mirrors our fleet of elementary school devices. Based on common technology refresh cycles of four years, feedback from our middle school technicians about the degrading performance of the devices, and seeing the increased cost of device repairs, I believe it is in the best interest to prioritize a teaching device refresh at the middle school level. The return devices, the, the old ones we'll get back, will either be inventory to support needs at the elementary level, distributed as teaching devices to our middle school TAs, or sold on the open market to recoup value from the original purchase. I'm going to be looking for board approval of this purchase at the upcoming April meeting. The next topic is purchasing new Chromebooks for our fifth grade students for the upcoming school year. After seeing how our fleet of learning devices has historically, has historically been managed, I believe there are some key considerations that should be applied. Those are, I don't think any student should have a primary learning device that is older than five years old. We typically leverage iPads or Chromebooks, and neither of these devices remains a reliable learning solution after five years of use. No middle school student should have a dedicated device for over four years. As our students progress through the grade levels, our teachers increase and expand on innovation and exciting learning opportunities. School devices cannot typically sustain innovation and excitement after four years of use just because of normal wear and tear by our 10 to 13 year old kids. The physical components of the hardware also cannot officially handle the processing of evolving and expanding learning. Proactively replacing devices after four to five years of use also helps us reduce repair costs and avoid downtime for students that might be sidelined to a broken or aged out device. Another consideration is that it's going to help the district avoid bigger fleet purchases of multiple grade level devices because our re we are replacing smaller number of devices more often. This will also provide consistency for students and families that every student will receive a new device in fifth grade and that devices will remain theirs until they graduate. This will also ensure our students are learning with technology tools that are relevant and not outdated or obsolete. As part of an overall refresh roadmap, I believe we should begin purchasing a full cohort worth of learning devices each year at fifth grade. I am looking for board approval of this purchase at the upcoming April meeting. The final topic is refreshing our STEM lab computers across all four of our, of our elementary schools. We have 52 STEM devices in total. The current iMac machines are approaching seven years of use and we have at least one to two per lab that are no longer reliably working. To avoid upcoming repair costs on older equipment and to help us ensure our students are learning with technology tools that are relevant, I believe we should refresh our elementary STEM labs for the upcoming year. I also recommend we move to a Mac Mini with a larger monitor setup instead of the all-in-one iMacs that we currently have. This will allow us more flexibility to prioritize different components throughout the life of the device. For example, if we wanted to upgrade our elementary STEM labs in another seven years, with Windows devices instead of Apple devices, now we only need to prioritize changing the computer instead of the entire unit. The same is true for things like web cameras or monitors. 
I am looking for board approval of this purchase at the upcoming April meeting. All right. That being said, is there any questions regarding any of these topics that I've just presented? I have 150 questions, but I will start with <laughs> what's a gig? Okay, no, you're not even gonna be able to help me with that. The I'll just start with two and then I'll let Ryan take over. Maybe you'll have some that I have on my paper. Okay, so the, the WAN, uh, I think asking us as a board, it feels like a cardiovascular surgeon asking like, you know, what scalpel to use. Uh, that sounds great. That I trust your expertise and your judgment. Would we need village approval? Yes, so uh, for this project, um, our company that we're going to uh, contract with will handle all of the permitting and working with the village to get that accomplished. Okay. And then with the E-rate grant that you discussed, and I know we had run into a little bit of an E-rate grant discrepancy with the last round of Chromebooks that were purchased, Do should we foresee or could there be a foreseen discrepancy in what you anticipate the E-rate would cover versus what we might actually accrue? Um, we won't start the project until we have confirmed funding through these different measures. Okay. But with the cost reduction here, I mean, there's a significant payback. I mean, at 80% reduction, the payback period on that would be pretty fast. Correct. Yep. Right? So. Yep. And remember, the issue with E-rate wasn't on the Chromebook purchase. That was 100% funded. Uh -huh. It was on the network upgrade project and the initial number that Greg had pegged. Okay. But there was quite a bit of a moving target at that point in okay. terms of a lot of extra federal stimulus dollars that were coming this in. This target is less moving. Yes. Okay, then that helps. And then I'll ask one more, and then I'll let Ryan go for it. So the Chromebooks, what did we just buy through that E-rate into our, what, what just got purchased? Uh, 1,500 ASUS Chromebooks that are in the hands of all of our fifth through eighth grade students. Okay, so when you, because I love this pathway and this plan, when would you initiate, what's the first moving part of this? Because if we just got Chromebooks for fifth graders, then they're good for four yes. years. Yes, so as of next year, what'll happen is um, the eighth graders as they graduate, their device will drop back down to second grade. We're gonna purchase new devices for the fifth grade, which means that then sixth grade, will have their device for a second year, seventh grade will have their device for a second year, eighth grade will have their device for a second year. And then those all move up the following year, we buy another device in fifth grade, and then the eighth grade device then drops back down to, I believe it was the third grade in my, uh, in my roadmap. Okay, so the, this year, this upcoming fall, a current second grader will get a device that's one years old. Correct. Because it's coming off of an eighth grader that just started it. Correct, exactly. So following this, what would be the oldest device in use starting in the fall? Starting the fall, I believe we'll have a five-year Lenovo device that was our existing device prior to our ASUS purchase, and we'll use that for another one year of our fourth graders. And then that's still in your threshold? Exactly. Okay. All right, Ryan, go ahead. Thank you, RJ. Yeah, no problem. So I'll just follow up on that, on this topic specifically. So a couple questions. So... Um, have we explored a, just a lease program since we're buying these things or is, uh, since we're just, we're buying them out, right? Correct. Completely, yep. but we're not, ex have you explored a lease program? Um, yes, we are working, uh, actually one of the Apple programs that are offering right now is something similar to that where we purchase um, a bigger amount up front. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the third year, we have an option. If we want to sell it back to Apple for a credit for a new device, we can either buy it, that, that second payment and keep it. Okay. Um, so we have some options there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the uh, second question, um, is the intent with your cycling here to eventually get it to the point where we're only buying for cohorts a year? So we're not doing like, because I think historically what we've done is we buy a bunch of computers, we wait a couple of years, then all of a sudden we buy a bunch more computers, right? When this should be kind of just a built-in budgeted ongoing cost every year. Is that the, the that's my That's my goal. Okay. Um, every year we buy devices, less devices than the big purchase, and then we work them through the, through the roadmap. Okay. Then um, my last question actually is on the data center. Why, why physical data center? Why not, why not AWS or why, yeah? Um, I like personally um, our data being close to us. Yeah. Um, AWS, um, a lot of times their data is all, all over the world. Yeah. Um, the data center that we're kind of, um, kind of focusing on is that, um, I don't want to, give too much information, but it's close, it's within driving distance of us right now. Yeah. So it's 24 hour uh, monitoring, 24 hour security. There's someone that's gonna be watching it all the time that has all of the uh, correct fire suppression systems in place um, and it's and it's local. So that's where I'm. Okay, going. I'm just thinking, I mean, from the standpoint of, you know, it, it on-premise solutions are, are 
at some point you're probably going to have to go to the cloud. I mean, right. So, right. So why it's, I mean, it's, it's really up to you, right? You're going to know way more about this than I do. I just know that on-premise solutions is an expensive proposition in general. Right. Right. Um, at well, least as an upfront cost. And then at some point when you have to refresh those servers, so it's not cheap. So, so. that is part of this uh, package with the data center that we're talking about. Yeah. When we talk about going to the, the data center in our head, in my head, it's, it's going to the cloud. We're going to be able to access our information virtually. Right. Um, so it's going to live on uh, servers that are not that, owned by us. Oh, got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. There you go. That's, yeah. That answers my question. Lease to lease, right? Not lease to own. <laughs> but this is a physical data center. I, but not what, owned by us. Right. But I assume that they've got catastrophic redundancy, different location, all of that. Yes. Yes. On-site, off-site, and uh, disconnected from the internet. So they'll do a backup. Okay. Then they'll right. unplug it Perfect. so it's not even connected. And then question, the WAN that we're talking about building around Deerfield. Yep. What sort of, uh, who owns that? So when the project is complete per E-rate rules, the district cannot own um, the actual network. Uh, the company that's going to install it is going to be the purveyor of it. Um, but as long as we maintain an agreement with that, it is solely ours. Mm -hmm. So if I, I was trying to give an analogy to my wife, she asked, you know, I ran this presentation through her. She's like, RJ, what's a WAN? I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and I tried to explain it to her as imagine um, a WAN being like 294. It connects two points, like both of our schools. It's an eight lane highway. And in normal utility companies, we're traveling down that highway with other cars. And our, our own private fiber WAN means take that same eight-lane highway and remove all the other cars. It's just us on there. No, no, I'm familiar with a WAN. Oh. So do we have, do we, <laughs> and so what sort of redundant, like if someone in construction, they break, they cut the fiber, what sort of backup redundancy solution would we have? Um, well, we, we wouldn't have a, a necessarily redundancy by definition alone, but um, the way that the fibers are gonna be structured is we have uh, two fibers going in both directions. So what that looks like is if for any reason one side of it got, got cut or damaged or, or, or lost, the data goes in the opposite direction and still makes it back to the hub. So um, we're, we're, we're covered from, as long as something catastrophically doesn't hit the fiber, ring in two places, um, we're, 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 we're going to be okay. Thank you. You should be able to in the short term VPN and through the cloud anyways to the WAN, right? Yeah, we, so. we, we'll have some options, yeah. yeah. I have a quick question about the um, Chromebook purchase, RJ. Yep. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I, I didn't follow your chart as well as I should have, and I'm sure that's my fault, not yours. Um, but so if the students in fifth grade are going to be getting a new Chromebook that they're going to, that's going to be their device until they graduate from eighth grade, then when they graduate from eighth grade, do, do those devices still have a year's worth of life in them and they go to the second graders or how is that, how are the second, third, once, once we go through this whole cycle where um, I guess four years from now um, when all the fifth graders and eighth, sixth, seventh and eighth graders have their own devices, how are the second, third and fourth graders getting their devices? So if you can imagine uh, the district almost kind of being split in half, um, our fifth through eighth grade students, when they have their device in fifth grade, it'll follow them all the way through eighth grade. The plan at that point is to then um, either sell or repurpose those devices to bring value back to the district. The first, second, third, fourth grade devices, they're going to be on their own cycle. So um, it's hard to, to see with uh, the picture that we're looking at now, but this refresh plan actually went out like eight or nine years. Uh, you just you got to kind of roll it out down down the path, and what's going to happen is uh, in, in year 2024 25, um, we buy new iPads because those have kind of aged out, and then in 25 26, um, in second grade we actually buy another um, cohort of devices in second grade. That device will then follow up until the student gets to fifth grade. We'll still have two more years left on that device. It'll swing back down to uh, the second grade. They'll take that up until fourth grade, and then we'll kind of weave them back into the into the roadmap. But from a student Got perspective it. and from a family perspective, um, the goal is so every student and family can expect a new device in fifth grade that they maintain and stays theirs all the way through graduation. So at some point we will have to buy new cohorts of devices for the younger students, but it won't be it, it won't be as much and it won't be every single year. Exactly. Exactly. You mentioned you. the STEM lab 
equipment. Um, so that money is already budgeted. This isn't anything additional. Correct. As long expect. as John doesn't take any budget money out of the budget, yeah, we're okay. <laughs> and that is the same. So the the data center money, the learning device refresh, all of that is already presumptively covered. Yeah, that's correct. RJ and I have talked about all of it. Yep. And then last question, the um, devices for the middle school teachers, and so it's just his assumption is to complete an elementary school device. So that is on the horizon. This middle school has to happen first. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. I think that's the question actually on that one on the middle school, because that's another one that comes up every couple of years is that we buy a bunch of computers, don't buy some computers, and then buy a bunch. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, is the idea eventually to get that on some sort of cycle similarly to this, or are we just going to continue to refresh it all at once at certain periods? No, from a, my, my plan is, uh, yes, we will be on a refresh cycle every four to five years for teacher devices as well, based off of how the fleet's so doing. One-time ref refresh cycles. Well, I'm sorry. Not like this. They won't be like the students where every year you're buying, you're buying a little bit correct, more. Correct. Correct. It's going to be on a one-time Exactly. Cycle. The faculty and staff would be in their own kind of group of refresh cycles, and then the students would be okay. uh, uh, an independent one. Is that something that you would be willing to share with us in the future? The plan for the teach for the teachers? Oh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Being new to the board, I don't have any experience with any previous IT proposals or anything. But I would have to imagine having the role that RJ has now. Like this past 15, 20 minutes has been incredibly educational, and you've clearly put a lot of work into this. And so I just applaud the role, and I applaud the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I will say that you're lucky that Ken is not here <laughs> on this specific topic. Um, yep. <laughs> because this is, that, the questions I'm asking about these, uh, these big buckets, that's his biggest, probably one of his biggest pet peeves. And I, I could see why, because it's a big outlay yeah. Where it, I, it's, that's why I like your cycle with related to the students. I would just ask that you may think about that for the teachers because it's a big outlay every few years and it creates heartburn rather than just having a cycle where you're consistently updating your technology. It makes it makes it easier financially, right? Mm -hmm. To in in our at least in my mind to make that and probably for others at some point, right? Yeah, I think be. what. It would be helpful just having a, a complete district plan. You have a district plan for the students having a complete district plan for you know, um, administrators and you know uh, district staff and um, and um, our teachers. And I agree. I agree. And I, Kelly, uh, was went exactly where I was going to go, RJ. So uh, great presentation, uh, tight, clear, succinct, uh, and timely as well, uh, very well laid out. And this is uh, a great example of why we really want to have a, a chief technology officer here. So this is exactly the kind of thinking that we hope to bring. Uh, the WAN is, uh, uh, half of us know what it is, half of us have never heard of it. And um, <laughs> It's great that uh, we're getting nearly a million dollars of infrastructure improvement um, at somebody else's expense. And that's <laughs> exactly the sort of stuff that I was hoping that you would bring to us. So thank you. Just keep paying for yourself every year. That's I, right. I will try. I will try. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Next up, item 6.8, <laughs> resolution regarding COVID-19 operations. Mike. Yeah, I just muted myself. Uh, this is uh, a resolution regarding uh, mitigations going forward. Uh, so this essentially, uh, it uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, Kelly, I think uh, you asked about this. This is an express uh, delegation of uh, authority to the administration. Uh, and, and I'm summarizing here to utilize the mitigations that the administration feels necessary to keep kids in school and then assuring that we provide uh, ongoing reporting to the board transparency to the community about our actions. So I had saved my questions from earlier for this point. Um, and I, it sounds like you're going to be sending a communication to the district tomorrow. So I certainly don't want to micromanage or, or rain on that parade that you're about to uh, communicate out. Are we going to be, so when you say you, uh, you specifically are taking over, you and the administration, 
will that impact potential like notification of cases or like what should we see if any being a difference as to the way it's currently operating right now? What's the difference? Uh, Joanna, let's jump in. Sure. So we just want to make sure that we have clarity and transparency about when people will be receiving any communications, what that will look like. Um, you're not seeing any significant changes right now, but you'll see just everything outlined. We always want to make sure we have clarity on that. Like I said before, um, you'll be receiving specific communication if we have anything that reaches that outbreak um, criteria, but that can vary. When I said 10% or three cases, 10% could be one case in some of our classrooms or some of our specific settings, right? So um, when we're doing contact tracing like that, we'll be very focused on when we have that communication going to families. Um, and then we'll also have outlined what that next step could be for any classroom or setting that we are worried about uh, potential school-based spread. And those mitigation measures will be outlined in the communication coming from us. And that's been in partnership with the Lake County Health Department. And we already highlighted some of that, which is additional testing, which will be put in place, potential masking for one specific classroom or setting. We just want people to be prepared for what they might see if they have not already been directly involved in such a situation. And that should be what is spelled out tomorrow in this email? Correct. Or Yes. Correct. And just a reminder generally about we have um, updated test to stay, you know, from the Lake County Health Department okay. because it's now applicable to whether you're masked or unmasked because we know we have um, families making both choices. Okay. So, you know, all, everybody is able to still participate in testing. Because one of the questions that has been raised numerous times, it's a question you guys are all familiar with, which is if we get notified that there's strep in our classroom, why can't we get notified that there's COVID? Should parents expect a change in that? And if so, what change would that be? Yeah, so at this point in time, like we, there's no changes in our like notification, no significant changes. We have our dashboard, which is updated daily unless it's the weekend or something you know um, else and we update it as quickly as possible. But the notification that goes directly to a classroom is specific to when you know we're approaching or at potential outbreak status. That 10 and that's because threshold. you know we've had really great communication with families and parents and we, we welcome any questions, concerns or feedback and you know happy to have conversation. But you know one of the main things is that we specifically speak to families, parents and guardians when next steps or action steps are occurring and when we can share more information. So, you know, we always we don't want to communicate specifically to a classroom if there's nothing that's going to be action oriented necessarily. Um, and we've gotten some questions about, well, we might do something different and, or the family might make a different choice. And we just say very honestly, you know, please make that choice regardless if you think that's the right choice for your child. You know, um, if you want to be sending your child in a mask, please do so. We have like many, many children, you know, who are masking every single day in our schools. Um, and that's an individual choice for your child and your family. And we encourage you to keep doing that because, right. you know, a notification after one positive is still going to be too late, if that's the, the logic you're Totally applying. fair. Yeah. I'm just trying to get a sense, even just from a, the Lake County Department of Health or the Illinois Department of Public yep. Health, we as parents get a strep notification because that is a rule. Or that it, is some type of policy? To, to be honest, that's not even a required. It's required that things are reported to the Illinois Department of Public Health. There are some notifications that, is, that have been like best practice or kind of you know ongoing notifications. Um, but in terms of it being an, an a requirement, no, there's been things that we have ongoing sent uh, notifications for district-wide um, and that are you know recommended per the Lake County Health Department. COVID is, is not, not in there. that category right now. Okay, go ahead, Andy. Well, I wanna follow up. So yeah. what is the administration's view on why you choose to give strep notifications but to treat COVID notification or COVID cases differently? Yeah, so the uh, there's a list of diseases for which we must communicate that are required for us to communicate. Uh, strep is on that list. So there's specific reporting requirements to like Illinois Department of Public Health and then recommendations in terms of sending notifications to classrooms and, and um, things like that. So I don't put you on the spot, but it sounds like they're recommended but not required. And, and so the administration does send. The, 
the well the the COVID uh, COVID is not a required COVID one. COVID is not required. No. Right. Or, nor, but or, nor is stress. No, no. Right. But I mean, in terms of their specific reporting required, very different. Like COVID. Yeah, I'm not, not asking about reporting threshold. to this. I'm just. Yeah. I'm just asking. And, I'm following up on a, the question about parents. There's a history too, in terms of we've sent specific classroom notifications, and, and I'm happy to share that list of of what has historically been sent by our nurses um, in District 109 and neighboring districts as well. And, um, you know, in terms of the individual classroom notification, COVID is not like on that list of communicable, you know, diseases and that recommended classroom notification right now. You know, it's not saying you can, in transparency, it's not saying you cannot do it, but it's not at the threshold of, mm -hmm. of by any means, a required notification. So it's not required or recommended? But they're not, no one's going to come out and say, you know, a recommended notification. Um, again. Well, but it's not on that list of recommended. Correct. I Correct. just wonder if partly is because times just haven't caught up to. Uh, I, and, and in transparency, the Lake County Health Department hasn't re updated it since yeah. like 2002. Well, yeah. I mean, I think the other, the other difference, major difference here too, is, is that once that case is reported, contact tracing is actually taking place and being done by the health department. Whereas in a strep throat situation, that's not happening. So there is an actual structure for notification and contact tracing that already exists beyond the school notification. So the reason why strep is probably recommended is because they're not, there is no other structure. That's the only means in which to do that. Whereas there is another way to do that or get notifi notified if it theoretically hit you, right, through the county health department. That's my, th it's a theory, so. Yeah, very true. Joanna, could could you just give a little um, background or information on why we and and, I, and I'm sorry if this is repeating Kelly's question, but why we wouldn't um, notify for COVID? Sure, and there's not you know again it, there's decisions that every individual district can make. You know, we have just in transparency also polled neighboring districts. It doesn't mean everyone's doing the same or different, but it's always good to know and, and have a pulse on that. Um, at this point, you know, our current decision is not to notify um, individual classrooms, one out of um, some confidentiality concerns, right, in terms of who would be potentially absent and live streaming. We don't want to narrow the scope of who the positive individual would be. You also are soliciting a lot of follow-up questions that you just can't answer. You know, we would be getting a lot of follow-up calls, emails, and questions, and we, we cannot answer those uh, about, like, what were people masks? Were were they not masked? What was the distancing? Um, we we can't answer those questions. So we do update the dashboard. You know, people are aware that there's a case um, in the building. And again, if you are making the choice to have your child masked, we encourage you to do that and do that regularly, daily, um, because that is the best you know protection your child has right now against the virus. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I think when it ta when you come when it comes down to parental decisions, to your point that is a concerning factor for you, then you should probably proactively be working on those with your family choices. Anyways, I'm just, you know, it's a pure parent perspective of young kids. When we get a letter from the nurse that there's strep in the classroom and two days later, my kid has some suspicious symptoms. When I go to the pediatrician, I say, well, there's strep in the classroom. And, you know, it allows them to narrow down what they're looking for for a child. So as a parent, if I was told there are one or two cases of COVID in your classroom, that would make me more heightened in potentially looking at my child and going, you know, I wonder if it's not just that he's a little tired today, or I wonder if it's not just allergies. So sure. it, it's just my advocacy that I don't know. I understand the privacy issue, but when these kids go on the live stream, parents know, yeah, kids know, they already know who has COVID. That's a great so. point. And, but to Ryan's point, like we are already doing the contact tracing and directly notifying anyone in that classroom on that bus and any other setting who is considered a close contact, they're being notified directly. Um, so we are handling that piece. And if we did meet that threshold where there are multiple cases, you know, in that room, like I said, 10% or three, we would be notifying the whole classroom. So that notification would be sent. And then also as like a parent perspective, the difference too is because COVID is out there so greatly with the suspicion of knowing that there was a strep case. But I'll just give a personal, my son woke up on Monday morning, coughed three times, four times. I emailed the nurse, she says, go get a COVID test. You don't have to take your child for a strep test before sending him to school. 
took him for a COVID test and he was negative and he was safe to return to school. So that also is a different protocol than there is for strep as well. There's that safety piece as well. Correct, because we're still functioning as offering symptomatic COVID testing here. So that's why we just emphasize and are so appreciative again of anybody reporting those symptoms because we're providing that service. Here. And I didn't, I didn't do the COVID testing in the morning here at the district. I did it somewhere else. Well, I didn't want to, no, no, I didn't want to did. like, parents to be like, where no, is yeah. this morning yeah, COVID want, testing? I didn't, I didn't want it to be like, I got any special treatment. But just, no. <laughs> I mean, my, my last statement on this, our question, I guess, would be on on this is that this is it's just up for evaluation, just like every other mitigation that we have, right, within the district on COVID is that while this may be the approach that you guys are taking now, it may not be the approach that you will, you will take in the future. Right? Of, of course. And we are in constant communication, like I said, you know, with the Lake County Health Department, getting their opinion on it, evaluating it closely, and, and looking at where our numbers are, where we are, and it's, it's, we always are looking at everything. So the, yeah. the answer really more for the parent community, because I, you know, have the same no right kids. opinions, right, about this, is that... Right now, it's the determination is to not do it based off of the other structures that exist related to notifications and the requirements the county health department is recommending in terms of how we treat COVID cases. But at some point in the future, that may change if there was a means in which to do it or a reason to do it and change that, that, that policy and that notification process. Yeah, at the end of the day, all of the, the mitigations at this point are local. And so you're going to see this incredible a variety of different approaches, district to district, and there uh, there are going to be districts that will not do any contact tracing at all and not do any notification of any kind. And then there will be places like Deerfield that are going to continue to contact trace and going to continue to to notify. But for us, the the criterion uh, will be that that uh, ten percent. And that can be one, two, or three kids, mm -hmm. but uh, continually evaluating what we want to do moving forward. Yeah, so I, I think for the parents, because there's a lot of, obviously, feedback that's happening related to this specific topic is, you know, that it's going to be continually evaluated. So it's not, the answer is that right. we're never going to do that. It's right. more about when that may be the appropriate approach to take, and it's not now. Is it, is one of the current mitigations and one that I would imagine would still continue Children who come back on day six through ten is re they're required to mask. Is that correct? That is correct. And we we've had some questions and feedback about like is that being monitored and correct. enforced? And I said I appreciate the the question, the feedback. If, if for any reason they don't think it is, and we will absolutely take a closer look at that and make sure working with our building administration. Um, you know, that we yeah, are one of the blessings and curses of live streaming is you get a window into yeah. the classroom and you know exactly who has their masks on and who does it during the day. So I just want to make sure that that is a yeah. mitigated rule. Yep. And that will that'll be again included in our follow up communication. OK. Yeah. And for context, uh, this resolution is very similar uh, to uh, the one that uh, District 113 will met. There are a number of different districts that are approving uh, a similar resolution. And I'm assuming like this, this is going to provide you as an administration with the nimbleness to make fluid or potentially localized or classroom-based or child-based decisions without necessarily having to wait for a board meeting or come for board approval? Right. And, well, it does a couple of things. One, uh, it is the, the vote of an elected body does make a difference in terms of our ability uh, to defend a challenge if there is one uh, from... Uh, the members of the you know, inside or outside the organization. Uh, also, uh, the the agility that we might have uh, to act in the moment rather than waiting for a board meeting or calling a special board meeting, it gets the board out of that back and forth and back and forth on what really are ever-evolving mitigations that we need to apply. But it's primarily clarity, too, right? in terms of do we need to have a board meeting to discuss this or do we not, right? right? Because you right. always have the authority to act in the health and safety of the employees and the right. students, um, even without this. But providing the clarity specifically, I think, is, is also probably important. It is. And I, I really don't want to beleaguer, and I'm sorry that I'm asking so many questions. But um, And I don't even know if this is something that needs to be a part of the transmission, but what, if any, guidance w did Lake County give us in terms of when a classroom would actually be recommended to go virtual? So that's a great question. It certainly came up last week and, and there really, 
the, the messaging was continue with the testing cadence. Like we were not given any uh, specific guidance about flipping virtual. Um, so it's not to say it, it wouldn't happen and we certainly could put in our own guidance. That's something we'll discuss. But um, we were seeing, you know, fortunately, and again, very appreciative of working with the families and, and most importantly that kids were, were, you know, okay. You know, certainly were sick, but, you know, no one was, um, you know, very, very sick, and they were doing okay, and starting to feel better, and we were seeing less kids each time test okay. positive, right? Um, so that's what you're looking for, okay. right? If you were not seeing that result as you put additional testing in, that's where we would um, be in very much more so close contact with the health department about that decision. Thank you. When looking at the resolution, I have no problem with it at all, and the only thing I want to know is if it's appropriate or if it could be added in in some way, and I, I'm not speaking for the board, but I'm speaking myself as a board member, and I'm going to assume that our intent is always to have children in person learning, and that is not. If I'm going to sign a, if I'm going to approve a resolution, giving a, appropriate action to the administration, who I fully trust now, but who knows where you know employment goes in the future i would like to be this is sounding ever more ominous <laughs> here that, that I, I would like it to strongly say that i believe all of these things in respect of our first priority is keeping our students in-person learning i think that's covered in the return to learning plan that's that's referred to right so the return refer, return to learning plan 2021 to 2022 school year within that plan that he presented to us, it's clear that the intent was to keep students in school. Is that what, does it say that in that plan? Like, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it states that expressly. I mean, the, this, the, the return to learn uh, certainly suggests that that is the, the intent. And I can tell you that every single person on this team, we have a single, minded ambition to get kids in school and keep them there. I mean, that's the purpose of everything we're doing. I we would know also add that we don't have the option really right now, right. like for full remote, like right. per the state, like basically it's designated this year is in-person learning. We would have to specifically like to go full virtual or full remote. Mm -hmm. We we can't just, correct me if I'm wrong, but like we can't just do that. Like all no. we would have the um, authority to do even like with the, the resolution is talk about like individual classrooms or like based on like our COVID numbers. I think that's kind of what you're getting at too. Like the way the the state outlined it is, is you can't just um, go full remote. Danielle's on your head too because we read all that together <laughs> at the start okay. of the year. Yeah. But um, school is, is this this year effectively is be defined school as yeah. in person learning. Yes. Right. This takes us to the end of the school year, or this goes even starts us again in the fall. This resolution. I don't think there's an end date yeah, on I it. I think it's just until, if and until we would ever really amend good. the resolution. Right. I don't foresee ISBE changing that designation, though, right? No. As school is being in person. Right. And, yeah, and just the, for. Sorry, go ahead, Siri. I was just going to say, for a little context, I mean, the authority, I think that the, this is no more authority than the administration has always had. And, you know, before COVID, the board would never weigh in on these types of decisions, you know, how far apart students are sitting in a classroom or, you know, what they're doing in a lunchroom or anything like that. Those just are not issues that would ever come before the board. So, you know, COVID was a whole different thing with shutting down. I mean, that was just such a huge, much bigger scale decision than anything else. But all of these types of decisions are not, I mean, they're all operational and are not really appropriate for the board to, to be involved with. Yeah, and, so and I would, the solution just clarifies that. Yeah, and I would back up Siri on this to a certain and add that there was a unique situation last year, right, related to leadership and um, in terms of interim superintendents and the, what level of authority. So there were several things that were unique of why the board, I think, was more involved in this when traditionally we would not have been and probably should not have been as involved in this, um, in these types of activities. Oh, I think the resolution is great. I, I think the administration should. I haven't, I don't want to be a part of it. All I'm saying is, you know, I, you know, I guess I just want to make sure that it's clear that as we're approving yep. this resolution that 
our vision is to make sure our kids are in the classroom. That's all I'm saying yeah. is that would be, you know, that's we are, we are voting on this tonight. And so we have to be cognizant of making of wordsmithing this similarly. I mean, the mission vision is one sentence or two sentences. This is a quite a, a more heavy document. So I don't know. I kind of want to triple down on what Sari said and what you said, Ryan. Uh, it's also my perspective that we're in this resolution. I don't think we're actually granting any authority the superintendent doesn't already have. And I am in support of this, these resolutions to make that clear and for the avoidance of doubt and right. But I don't believe, I, I believe these are exactly the domain that a superintendent is responsible for a superintendent and his or her team are responsible for. And I hearken back to the training from the Illinois State Board people who talk about the board in the balconies and the team on the field, to mix metaphors. Um, and, <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, I feel like this is, uh, you know, this is not really given the superintendent and, and, and Mike's team uh, authority that they don't already have to make decisions. And Sari gave some great examples. I would go further and say, when I vote on this, I want to be clear, there's stuff in those whereas clauses that I don't agree with and I would not endorse. I've, and that's kind of dicta anyway. That's not, we're not voting on the whereas clauses, but we are voting on the resolutions and I do support the resolutions. And I don't agree with the whereas clauses, but that's a moot point, it's irrelevant. Thank you. All right, uh, if there's no more questions, we'll move on to uh, our consent agenda. Uh, I need a motion to approve it, uh, the consent agenda, which includes 7.1.1 uh, personnel, 7.1.1.1 resignations and retirements, 7.1.1.2 leaves of absence, 7.1.1.3 employment of certified staff, 7.1.1.4 employment of educational support staff, 7.1.1.5 employment of at will staff, 7.1.2 bills for payment, 7.1.3 destruction of closed session audio, and 7.1.4 approval of minutes from January 21st, uh, 2022 mission and vision study session. Can I just ask Dale a quick question before we, is that okay? Am I allowed to do that, Nick? Sure. Okay. Is it, tr again, first time on the board at this time of year, it feels like there was quite a few end of June resignations? Is that like a traditional cadence for the district that this is the time of year? Okay, I just wanted to get a sense if this is in the realm of normal. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry, I will I will so move. There a second. second. Roll call, please. Okay, Ms. Giacomo? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Can I get a motion to uh, 7.2? Can I get a motion to approve the treasurer's report? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Okay. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 7.3, a motion to approve the meeting minutes from February 17th, 2022. Uh, Ryan, you're an abstain on that. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Okay. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. Mr. Quo? Abstain. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 7.4, can I get a motion to approve uh, the closed session meeting minutes from February 17th, 2022? Again, Ryan's abstaining. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call, please. I'm sorry. That's okay. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Mr. Quo? Abstain. Ms. Wenner? Ms. Giacomo? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Um, so for our next one, if I could get somebody to put up our revised, I'll just read our new language into the motion, make it a little bit cleaner. Um, so uh, we need a motion to approve our mission and vision. Our mission statement, uh, what we're approving is District 9, where challenging experiences foster confidence, collaborative relationships build community, 
and creative environments ignite curiosity. And our vision, boy, you're going to make me work here. Yeah, can you make that bigger? <laughs> Sorry, I'm diving for you and for Sari. <clears throat> and we're approving our vision, which is we will develop each student to be emotionally resilient, socially skilled, and academically prepared by forging connections within, across, and beyond our classrooms, and by embracing each student's uniqueness. We did it. <laughs> Need a motion. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Morrison. Aye. Ms. Wenner. Aye. Ms. Jackamu. Aye. Mr. Quo. Aye. President Montgomery. Aye. And Mr. Begley. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve 7.6, uh, the 2022-23 fee recommendations? I so move. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Wenner. Aye. Ms. Giacomo. Aye. Mr. Quo. Aye. Mr. Morrison. Aye. President Montgomery. Aye. And Mr. Begley. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, I need 7.7, .7, a motion to approve the 2022-23 Board of Education regular meeting schedule. So moved. Second. Oh, you too. <laughs> Roll call, please. Ms. Jacobu? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 7.8, I need a motion to approve the intergovernmental agreement to facilitate the sharing of identifiable school student record information between Township High School District 113 and its feeder districts. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, I need... Uh, Motion to approve 7.9, the approval of the consultant agreement for interim associate principal. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. 7.10, uh, I need a motion to approve the 2022-23 administrator and exempt compensation. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 7.11, motion to approve the non-renewal non of probationary staff. So moved. Second. Roll call. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 7.12, motion to approve uh, the custodial contract uh, between 109 and citywide building maintenance. Can I, before I so move, can I just um, re refresh my memory? When does this take place again? When does this start? They'd begin July 1st. Okay. Um, they're in talks with uh, our existing firm to see if they wouldn't be happy to let them also have the month of June for summer cleaning purposes. Okay. And then were they able to have some potential conversations with our current staff members as well? Yes. Our current custodians? Okay. All right, then. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Okay. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, this is going to be a long one, folks. Uh, 7.13, I need a motion uh, to approve the policy final readings. Uh, 4 colon 20, 4 colon 40, 4 colon 50, 4 colon 60, 4 colon 70, 4 colon 80, 4 colon 90, 4 colon 100, 4 colon 110, 4 colon 150, 4 colon 160, 4 colon 165, 4 colon 170, 4 colon 175, 4 colon 180, 4 colon 190, and 6 colon 135. Can you, re can you repeat that, Nick? Sure. Okay. Second. I will, I, oh, I was just listening Just listen to the tape. <laughs> All right, Maureen and uh, Roll Brian. call, please. Okay, Ms. Wenner? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Giacomo? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Uh, can I get a motion, 7.14, can I get a motion to approve the resolution regarding COVID-19 operations? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Jacomu? Aye. Mr. Quo? Aye. Ms. Wenner? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. President Montgomery? Aye. And Mr. Begley? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up is committee reports. Um, I can go for True North. We just had a board meeting last week. Um, one, like one of the be best parts, I mentioned this last meeting that Dr. Schneider does is he has um, basically informational items for us that actually teach us about the world of special education and the learners. And this time he had Mrs. Amy Cutler, who's a parent at Kipling, an awesome second grade and I think kindergarten parent as well. And she is also a representative of the PPS. Am I saying that acronym correct? So I, just to give you guys a little brief background, her learner in second grade has some mobility and other special needs and has been fully included in her second grade classroom at Kipling. And so the mom just presented what a wonderful experience that had been. And so I would encourage our administration, hopefully, and you know, if we talk about what's good in 109, to maybe consider inviting a person like Amy to share her experience with having a learner with low incidence disabilities in our district, because it's a pretty cool story and she's a pretty cool parent. Um, I'm sure Joanna, you know her very well. Um, so that was a real big highlight. They also approved um, an increase salary amount, wage amount for their teaching assistants with their optimistic to be able to recruit and retain teaching assistants because that's been a challenge for them. And that was the main highlights of our meeting. I mean, it really was, we all at the board were just so overwhelmed by the information this mom presented about her journey and about, it really, I mean, I felt kind of ruffly feathered about being the 109 representative because I'm like, you know, we're doing so many things well. But to hear a story about a learner who is being fully included successfully in an environment where both her and her peers are successfully engaging needs to be shared. So she's amazing. She doesn't give herself enough credit for the work she does and the advocacy she does. So, yeah. And I would love to hear more about the PPS and some of these other things that um, impact the yeah. children with disabilities in our district. She's great. Thanks for sharing. Uh, next up is our second opportunity for open community participation. Would anybody like to address the board? All right, hearing none, um, board superintendent other. I just have two quick things. One is I wanna thank everybody for all their work on the mission vision, um, especially Eric um, who and Danielle who did a ton of work. Um, and I think it, I'm very happy with the results. So thank you everyone for, for your input and I think it, Everybody contributed and added a great deal to it. Um, and then the second thing, I just want to um, thank uh, Joanna and her team for all the work with the um, transition to uh, mask recommended and um, the uh, um, dealing with the two outbreaks that we've had. I know it's been a lot, and uh, I appreciate all your work. And um, uh, and to uh, Eric and everybody who is working on the communications that are going to be going out and putting together those policies. Um, thank you very much for all your work. Anybody else? Mike? Yeah, really briefly, I'm really uh, proud of the product that we have. I love the process. Uh, Eric, the new tool, the thought exchange, the, the opportunity to get input from a much broader range of stakeholders, uh, both in the district and then uh, outside our buildings and the community. So, huge thing and really uh, challenging and interesting feedback that we got. Um, it's the word cloud that, that uh, came from that was uh, something that uh, we might not have been able to predict ahead of time. So that was really terrific. And also uh, as agonizing as it is sometimes to wordsmith uh, in a big group, I think that uh, it worked pretty darn well. I think you gotta be really proud of the product and also of the process. So. Uh, I completely agree with, uh, with, with Sari on that. And then I, again, uh, Joanna, uh, this has been crazy, a uh, couple weeks here and Joanna and Eric have partnered, 
Yeah, I was uh, going to say well, only these past few. Well, weeks. the last couple since the uh, since the the last board meeting actually has been kind of a zany thing. So, uh, but uh, all the work on the communication and <coughs> contact tracing and all the other aspects of this has really gone as well as it could possibly go. And uh, finally, uh, I, another thank you to our parents for being uh, so continually flexible with us. It's been uh, terrific. And obviously our staff have a, a well-earned break ahead of them. I sure hope they take it and I hope uh, we all come back refreshed. Uh, just a quick question, Mike. So now that um, all the heavy lifting has been done on Mission Vision, mm. We've probably talked about this before, but it'd be nice to refresh it. When should the board and the community expect to see a strategic plan? Well, Danielle and I talked about that uh, earlier today. Uh, uh, so Joanna, Danielle, and I are, I'm sure, already individually formulating different ideas for that. Uh, we'll begin that uh, mentally. Uh, we've already begun that, frankly, uh, but then uh, we utilize uh, the balance of the school year uh, to, to work with the administrative team. We have a retreat in early June. The presentation to the board of the strategic plan is scheduled for August. Okay. So in theory, implemented for the coming school year. Correct. Okay. And then what about the, um, uh, I'm completely spacing on the word. We have mission, vision, and then values. Sorry, I couldn't get the word out. Uh, is that something that is board work or is administration work? To list values out? is board work. Uh, we'll uh, present a draft. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, some thoughts on that. Uh, Nate Eklund has already drafted some okay. of those, and we'll have a special uh, a meeting of the whole okay. uh, for that, and then uh, complete that. Thank you. Not on COVID, I guess. The question: the retirement party is that back on, or is that not? We used to do a retirement dinner, remember? And when COVID happened, we obviously stopped that. And people have retired since. Yeah, we've talked about, we already have some plans in place for our retirees. Okay. Um, a, a large scale dinner is not one of them okay. at this point. All right. Um, but <laughs> we do have, it's up in my office actually, we have some things in the works. Mike will be going to the different buildings to thank and address some of the retirees. So there are okay. some things in the works with principals. So we're not quite there, is, is, is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought I just thought it was a cool event, and it was sad to see it not happen for a couple of years here. And so I'm sure it predates me. So I would love yeah. to hear more feedback on it. It's something we'll we'll look at next year. I can help with the party planning. <laughs> 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 you I we will. All we'll right, let's call order to this meeting, please. <laughs> <laughs> Any anything else for the? All right, uh, if I can get a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. Thank you, everyone.